Good evening, everybody. Welcome into the Nittany Lions Sports Report. It is live here on Bob Long Sports every Tuesday evening with Bob Long and Tyler Galehouse. Tyler, we are through non-conference play for the Penn State Nittany Lions. They are a perfect 3-0. and And boy, it was just so easy getting here, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, everybody thought it would be the pit game would be the toughest out of conference game. Uh, turns out it was the Appalachian State game. Indeed. Um, but I think the team grew a lot from that. Uh, they took uh, they took down Pitton fifty one to six. Never really a game, especially after the first quarter, first half. And then uh, they continued the train rolling last week um, on Saturday against Kent State and won um, the way that that many believe they should win that type of game. So with a Kent State route and then a come uh, game coming up against the University of Illinois on the road on Friday night. I think the Friday night being really the biggest part of that story. Less so even the trip to Illinois. It's a team that's two and one right now. But they struggled against the same Kent State team that Penn State just wiped the floor with and lost a game to, we'll say, a marginal South Florida team without Willie Taggart running the show. They are 3-0, and but there's nothing about that game that was particularly impressive. So with that in mind, and not to totally discount the Illinois team, but I think it's a great opportunity, Tyler, to take a step back just three weeks into this season and talk a little bit about the positional grades and to start to evaluate how the players – on this team have played on a position by position basis where the biggest room for improvement is and how they're going to move forward but before we do that quick couple minute thought about the Kent State game this weekend yeah I think that um the one thing that jumped out to me was the reemergence of uh, DeAndre Tompkins yes. four catches uh, 101 yards and a touchdown um that was something that they they really um Made an, made an effort to do this week was to get him the ball. He came into the game with zero catches. Um, and, and I think that's something that you see a lot with the wide receivers on Penn State. Um, the ball is being spread around by McSorley. I mean, Penn State's ground game has been going, and that's been spread around too. Um, but just to see DeAndre Tompkins get on get on a pace there was good for, for Penn State. And I also I thought it was good to see a lot of the younger guys, like freshmen, true freshmen, that you know we're seeing um, being able to use this new red shirt rule to uh, – to their ability, and, and it's a strength for Penn State to see guys like uh, Daniel George get out there and catch a long touchdown pass. Um, uh, Jahan Dodson got some time. A lot of Zach Kuntz, a tight end. So a lot of guys were able to get time. Rasheed Walker at left tackle, just naming the two, some of the true freshmen that were able to get out there. And, and you know, not that they're and, – and they probably won't end up playing much down the road um, this year, but um, Jason Owe is another one that um, he's actually going to travel with the team on – um, on Friday to Illinois, and an interesting rule is that I just learned today, Bob, was at, for true freshmen, you have the four games that you can play in and still redshirt. However, if you travel, um, it is considered a game whether or not you play in that game. Yes. So something to keep an eye on. So Jason Owe and Nick Tarburton, two of the freshman DNs, will be traveling, um, but that doesn't mean that they'll necessarily be playing, but that does go as, as game number two, um, for at least Oway, I'm not sure where Tar Burton stands. Yeah, and you mentioned Tar Burton, a local kid here as well. They have a lot of high expectations for him, a guy that we thought could be pretty malleable from a position perspective, whether he could play in the linebacking core yeah. or on the defensive line. I think that's a great opportunity for him, and maybe the expectation is that they start to run away with that game in the second quarter so that you're not wasting that opportunity to put them in the game. They're expecting to get those exactly. guys some snaps. And, and that's why I love the new red shirt rule, because it's important to see if these guys can really do it. And, and you know, somebody can end up having a key play down the stretch and ending up still red shirt. I mean, you never know. It's um, Right. But, but really, if you're that good at the end of the day, you're probably leaving after four years anyway, so your red shirt senior year might not even matter. But that's that's for another time. It's a nice problem to have as Penn State's Definitely. recruiting – you know, it, really start and to it's, improve. And it's benefiting them this year, especially with defensive end, I believe, um, you know, because they came in and that was a strength of the team. But then they got the news of Torrance Brown, which wasn't as surprising as right. uh, Ryan, Ryan Buckholz. Buckholz. Sure. And now Shane Simmons is still in a boot. Um, I think he's progressing as, as from what we hear in the press conference, which isn't much from Franklin in, in, in regards to injuries. But I would expect to see him out there rather sooner rather than later. Um, but I mean, it's it is good that guys like Oa and Tar Burton can step up with that red shirt rule, especially the thin position um, as of late, like defensive end. And we're going to get to that, and probably a great time to make that segue. We're going to do uh, positional picks here 
on the Nittany Lions Sports Report. Bob Long, Tyler Gellhouse, really excited to be alongside with you guys again here tonight. Every Tuesday night we come on live talking about the Penn State Nittany Lions. So positional grades, it's a great time to adjust and a ba- great time to take a step back, Tyler, as they are 3-0. and Not like we expected them to be here. But as we go position by position, what's been really good? What has been maybe on the wrong side of the spectrum? And, and where do we think the most opportunity for improvement will come? So let's start right down the middle at the quarterback position, Trace McSorley. Give me a grade for that position as a whole, because we've yeah. seen Sean Clifford sure. as well. Sure. I'm going A with quarterback. Um, I think Ricky Ronnie has done a tremendous job not only calling the offense, but also uh, working with these quarterbacks. Um, I mean, McSorley, his stats, passing stats really aren't going to jump out to you. Granted, the first game of the season was more of a, um, a dramatic win, which is in the case you don't really care about the stats at the end of the day. Um, so you have that game, and then you go on the road to Pitt and play in miserable rain. So that obviously impacted his stats when you're looking at stats. But I'm looking at his over, over, overall game um, in, in the last past three games, and I think that he's made great decisions. Um, five touchdown passes. He's been spreading the ball around. He only has one interception. It was last week. I think he's run the ball exceptionally well, too. He, has, um, he, he leads a team with six rushing touchdowns. Um, he's averaging five yards a carry. Um, and, you know, that factor sacks in, too. So um, I, I would give quarterbacks an A. And then, I mean, you talk about not having Tommy Stevens, who is slated to come back this week at Illinois, according to James Franklin. Uh, he, he also could have played the last couple of weeks, if need be. Um, Sean Clifford on the season is 4 for 4, 151 yards and two touchdowns. And they his, really like him, His too. passing rating is 582. Pretty unbelievable. Yeah. So, um, Again, I mean, there's a time I, granted, and a place granted, that he comes right, into the game. Right, but I mean, that's still impressive to come off the bench yep. like that in your first ever games ever. Uh, you know, the opponents, whatever. But um, he, he looks good. And I mean, it's it, like we like I said, it's a great problem to have. We talked about it a little bit last week with the, the quarterback situations at George, Alabama, Clemson. I mean, Penn State, I mean, next year, I mean, everyone thinks, you know, it, it, it could be Tom, it should be Tommy Stevens, but you never know. I mean, Cliff, you, you would like to think it's going to be That'd Stevens be after Wade. Right, but... He's also been prone to injury over the years, too. Right. It's great to have somebody like Sean Clifford right there just in case something happens to um, Tommy Stevens. Okay. So I agree. I would, I would give the quarterbacks an A. All right. What position you want to go with next? Uh, we'll just stay on the offensive side. We'll go running back. All right, running back. Yeah. Running back for me is going to be a, a B plus, and the reason I say that is because we're talking about the entire suite of running backs. Miles Sanders has been an A+. Plus. Miles Sanders, especially when you needed it in that Pittsburgh game and in that Appalachian State game, was an absolute force and was the best athlete on the offensive sure. side of the football. Miles Sanders has been an A+. Mark Allen has been a solid B+. And then, frankly, it's just Ricky Slade making, making strides, right? And so it's one of those things, hey, he's a freshman in college. Let's, let's make the analogy to go into class. You come into college and you think you're ready, and maybe that first exam comes for midterms, and you're, not, you're just not quite ready for it, and, and you get to see. That's okay. There's a lot of time to still come back, earn your way back by the end of the semester, and get yourself into that B-plus or A conversation. That's where Ricky Slade is right now. He needs to get a little bit tougher with the football. He needs to hold on to it better, and he has to understand that when he receives the ball a little bit less than he's used to in high school, there's still a way to come in and be fresh, be sure. as fresh as you can be and make that impact. So I'll say B+. Plus. Everything's in the right direction. I just think Ricky Slade had a tough start. Yeah, and if I could touch on that a little bit, I think that um, I think Miles Sanders put everyone's um, nightmares of not having Saquon Barkley behind him. Sure. I mean, not that you ever forget a player like that, but, I mean, I don't know if I'd rather have anybody else come in after Saquon Barkley than Miles Sanders. I mean, um, you, you often... He is so much I'm bigger then, and stronger like, than he was. Yeah, too. I mean, he and, and he is quick. He's fast. Um you know, and he's he is the he's one of the leaders of that running back room. You know, you talked about Mark Allen. Um, he's a redshirt senior as well as Johnny Thomas. Uh, he's not really going to get many carries this year, but um, but I I agree with you. I think that the the running back room, and I think it's actually a good spot for Slade not to come in here, not for them to expect too much out of a freshman, but you know he can learn behind guys or above him on a depth chart, and and they're still going to use him. I mean, he's still going to get his carries. Uh, he might be getting five carries a game, but. Um, you know, you got to go with the hot hand, and right now, uh, it's Sanders and even Mark Allen's playing pretty well. All right, let's keep it going. The wide receivers, Tyler, what's your grade? 
This, this is a little bit of a tough one, um, but I'm going to go with a B minus. Um, and I say that because I think there's there's some positives and and quite a bit of negatives as well. I, I'll start with the positives. Um, I think KJ Hamler has exceeded everyone's expectations um, in terms of playmaking. He has good hands. Um, you know, he he can really he can do it all. He can stretch a field. He can hurt you underneath. He can hurt you in the run game. Um, I think that the experience aspect is very good too, which is why I'm giving a B minus. But I think um, the under the upperclassmen and really it's the two uh, two well, Juwan Johnson's redshirt junior, DeAndre Tompkins' redshirt senior. I think that. I've expected a little more out of them this year, specifically Juwan Johnson. He's had the drops. Um, I'm not sure what it is. Uh, he still leads a team with eight receptions, but only for 90 yards, no touchdowns. Um, a little bit surprising there. He did get a touchdown called back um, in the Kent State game, as did as did Cameron Sullivan Brown and KJ Hamler early in the first half. Um, so I think that those, the receiving group though, and I think they're doing a good job blocking for the most part. I mean. I don't think there's going to be that one guy that McSorley is keen on and, and looking at every play, but I think they're going to spread the ball around. Okay, fair enough. Uh, I'm going to go with uh, – we're talking class here, right? So I'm going to say they're the group that hasn't turned in their project yet. They're, they're just – I, I right. think they're, they're working hard, but they're a little bit past and the deadline. They, also have they haven't quite right. showed up as a unit yet. You've seen flashes. KJ sure. Hamler's been unbelievable. Juwan Johnson, he has all the tools. Brandon Polk. You know, he's that I mean, brilliant guy right. who just hasn't brought the, the project back to class. But and when it comes, well, yeah, it's right. going to be brilliant. Exactly. That's so I, like, I don't know. No, how, I like that analogy. That's I don't know how I grade it. What B, something like that. But <laughs> yeah. they're the group that's a little bit late turning in the project. But hey, I mean, when that's a good thing is is you know they're not there yet and they've still been, you know, extremely serviceable. Yes, so, agreed. Um, hopefully they start to pick it up just in time for the Big Ten season here. Because I still think that's a strength of this roster. At the end yeah. of the day, I mean, it's definitely a strength, especially on paper. And I mean, a lot of these guys are mismatched nightmares. Right. So I mean, some guys can kill you deep. Some guys underneath. You got some guys with great size, like Johnson. Mm-hmm. You got the speedsters, like Polk, Tompkins, and, and Hamler. So I mean, it really is a good, a good group that they have. All right, let's go with the uh, tight ends. This is a position we didn't really know a lot about coming in. You know, John, Jonathan Holland, we thought would maybe be the guy. There was thoughts about if Nick Bowers would be ready. That clearly has not happened. Fryermuth and Dalton have been solid in, in limited action. What do you think about the tight ends? So I think that um, what's happening with the tight ends isn't a surprise to anybody. Uh, when you lose a player like Mike Gesicki, who is, a, I mean, let's be honest, who's strictly receiving tight end, I think that there definitely is an upgrade there blocking-wise. I think Clear. that um, there's definitely an upgrade blocking-wise at the tight end position. Um, however, there's a downgrade at the receiving aspect of the tight end. But it's kind of what I thought it was going to be like tight end by committee. Um, Nick Bowers is still battling an injury, although I do think – um, he will be back soon. I, I'm not sure what his capacity with the team is going to be because I think right now they have three guys that they really like mm, for in, sure. in Holland, a redshirt junior, true freshman Pat Fryermuth, who is um, having a very nice fall, getting started catching some nice passes here. And then you have uh, redshirt sophomore Danny Dalton as well. So I think, you know, you don't want to roll with too many tight ends, but I think three tight ends, you know, you kind of rotate. One guy might be better at blocking. One guy might better be better at receiving. You know, it's always good to have have a couple different guys that can do it. So I think the tight end by committee. I mean, I'll give them a solid B. Um, nothing, nothing crazy. I don't think that they have any touchdowns this year. A um, couple catches here and there, but they haven't they haven't hurt Penn State either yet. Um, but again, consider the opponents. But I'll give them a B. And let's talk about this block, blocking tight end really as an extension of the next position that we're going to hit, which is the offensive line. Right. Last year you had a Heisman favorite in Saquon Barkley and it just wilted away because as the better competition came around the second half of the season they could not block for Saquon Barkley so now you have a newcomer not a newcomer per se but a new role for Miles Sanders and you have a better offensive line and you have a better tight end blocking core with a coaching staff that's more willing to run guys in there and if needed, can even put a couple tight ends on the field at the same time. You would have never seen that last right. year. So on the offensive line, now after that App State game, I was I was right. ready to give them a D plus. Yeah, you were not you were not at all happy with the offensive line, and we talked about it the the preview week of App State that you know this is a strength, right? Like, you, like this is just one of the strengths of the team that we've we've never had the strength of the O line since 
you know, going back almost 10 sure. years. So. I mean, really, uh, before Michael Robinson, truly? Probably, yeah. Right? Because the, the yeah. real struggle started right after that 2008 year when Daryl Clark comes in. Sure. And we thought this is going to be a team that could run the table in the Big Ten. All of a sudden, Iowa comes to town uh, for college game day and can't block Adrian Claiborne, and the rest has really been history. Yes, it has. And, of course, there have been sanctions that have come across and less scholarships. Sure. We all know that story and the reasons why that position has been a little thin. And it takes a while to build up an offensive line. Absolutely. I mean, it takes years in the weight room and learning and footwork and all kinds of things. Um, so that's why it, it's not the kind of thing that just happens overnight. Right. So – I think in the last two games, and really we're just talking about Pittsburgh because Kent State was certainly overmatched. I think they played much better against Pittsburgh, better than the D plus I would have given them a, sure. against App State. So I'll put them in that B minus C plus range with room to improve. I, I do think that by the end of the year it's going to get better, and I think we're going to talk about it for next week's show, the Ohio State show, and put that up on the the whiteboard about how important it's going to be for Ryan Bates to handle, whether it's Nick Bosa or whomever else is going to be his backup, the athletes at not just the first level of the depth chart, but the second and even third level of the depth chart for Ohio State, why that's going to be so important. So, you know, kind of in waiting for that grade, but right now C-plus with yeah. B-, 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 B minus with it, room to improve. It's kind of like the wide receiver position, yeah. I think, here. I mean, yeah. I think it's too – the offense is, is, is filled with playmakers. I mean, it, it's the strength of the team, and – you know, they definitely haven't hit their stride yet, but I mean, they're definitely, it seems like they're trending in the right direction. And it looks like they're getting more continuous, right? We saw all these different uh, players out there, especially at the right tackle position after the first game against App State. Chaz Wright and Will Fry is essentially trading halves. And then against Pittsburgh, we saw each of those guys get the lion's share of the snaps with Will Fry's taking that position by hold in that second game. So now, at the very minimum, there's more of a continuous offensive line. Um, McGovern is very solid. Ryan Bates is probably the most athletic guy on that line. And uh, and Mennett's done a decent job in his first yeah. year at center. And uh, all those, you know, you're not going under center. You're getting all the snaps into the hands of Trace McSorley. It's the toughest there's position been to play on the offensive line. No maybe, problem Maybe there. outside of quarterback. Right, sure. Yeah. And, and plus the conditions that they had at Pittsburgh. Sure. And really, there was no problem. Right. And and the guy everybody forgets about is the uh, left guard, Stephen Gonzalez. Sure. I mean, you know, usually if you're not hearing the guy's name, he's doing his job on the offensive line. You know, right. I he doesn't really get flagged much for penalties. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and he's a he's a big guy and he he's very solid, especially especially in the run game. So it's good because we're going to talk about uh, Robert Landers uh, and the fact that he's going to be trying to get through that gap between Gonzalez and Mennett. And uh, if he's healthy as well as Nick Bosa, you know that left hand side of that line is going to be strained against no Ohio State, it. and we saw. In the last time those two teams met, that when Ryan Bates got injured, the left side of that line was a total liability and a big part of the reason yeah. they lost the football Definitely. game. So, Definitely. Uh, work in progress on the O-line, but better than it was against App State. So on the defensive side of the football, let's just stay right in the trenches. Defensive line, we knew some of the liabilities coming in in terms of uh, the players not being there, but we also thought this was going to be a position of depth. I think our opinion is... Uh, not changed substantially, but uh, changed in the nature in which we express it. What do you think about the D line? Yeah, I mean, it's. I think that's. It's hard to grade the D line um, again because they're going up, especially with App State and Kent State. They're going up against smaller lines. Sure. Um, App State. You know, Kevin Givens did not play. Yeah, he did not play. Um, I will say that I think Sharif Miller has had a great start to his season. Um, you know, but again, it's 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 tough to grade without going against the big boys yet. Um, and we know that, but um, I think that they've rotated pretty well. Their guys in um, it's probably the position I've actually I've watched the least of, um, and it's probably one of the most important positions on the field. But um, I'm I'm glad to see some of the younger guys getting in there. Um, I think Ellison Jordan, number 42, has provided um, you know some depth as well as Fred Hansard, um, PJ Mustafer on the inside. Yep. Because I'm more worried about the inside, even with the injuries to the outside that we had in preseason and with. With Shane Simmons, but I think that the deep, um, especially the last two weeks, I think that the uh, the interior defensive tackles have stepped up, and I think that's going to go a long way um, with determining how good this team is, especially when they play Ohio State in two weeks. But you know, I I'll give them you know a, the D line as a whole probably a B minus C plus area. 
Yeah, those three techniques I think are really important to think about, especially the Hansards of the world and uh, and Kevin Givens, who's going to be really that stalwart. Because when I mentioned depth, what I really meant was the depth at the end position and the fact that you have guys like Shaka Tony who aren't in the starting lineup and can just give you energy in limited snap counts. We expected to see... Limited. Sh- limited, because last year when he had to go in against Ohio State, he was right. playing... You know, 45-plus snaps, and he's, he just is not built for that. Right. Well, we talked about right. the Ryan Bates injury just a minute ago. That There's where Ryan Buckholz, that injury probably cost them that football game as well. Sure. And so limited steps, snaps is important for him. And the other thing that you know certainly would be nice is if we could have seen a full dose of Shane Simmons as well. Sure. And so when we look at this defensive line, yeah, you know, I'll give the grade. Um, I'll give the grade a, a B plus for now. Again, the App State game. The App State game was so poor, and the Pitt game was very good exactly. on both the O line and the exactly. D line. It was such a. It's, it's hard to really still know what you know what they are. Yeah, you know, but I think too with the defensive line, I think. Gross Matos has been very good for that. I as agree. Well. So I, agree. Um, I was a you tiny know, bit surprised by that. Uh, as the trend started moving there in the weeks leading up to the mm-hmm. season, that he was going to be named the number one guy, but I can see why. Yeah, right I mean, he, he's a big guy. I mean, he's very similar build to what Buckholds was. Yeah. Um, well, he played some time at three yeah, last year, and then they moved him outside to end, which I was a little bit surprised. So I think he, I think that the D-end, um, the D, at least the starting D-ends are playing very well right yeah. now. So I agree. Uh, the most interesting position on the field, the linebacking core. Jan Johnson is the starting middle linebacker, and then Koa Farmer, Cam Brown. But, of course, there he is. Micah Parsons just lying in the weeds, and he's gotten more and more snaps as the season has gone on. I mean, again, limited games once again, and Kent State's almost a throwaway. But he started to play a lot more snaps as you went from App State to Pitt. And we saw him, in my opinion – as a guy that was a touch out of position at times, which is absolutely normal for a freshman linebacker. What's not normal about a freshman linebacker is playing as many snaps as he has. Yeah. Uh, so he was able to, when he was out of position, what's so impressive is that he's able to come back to the play and get himself back into the mix so quickly. That's a testament to his athleticism and freakish genetics, frankly. I, I think he's got a chance, and clearly, I mean, I'm not on, on any island here, He's got a chance to be unbelievable, and I think the more snaps he gets now, you know, he was 100% a green light guy in terms of the mm-hmm. freshman. He was always going to be using this year and not redshirting. Why would you when he's only going to be here for three years? Right, yeah. I mean, he, Michael Parsons is is not even scratching the surface yet. I mean, he, he was a defensive end in high school. Um, you know, he's a running back in high school. I mean, this is his first time. Granted, he was an early enrollee, but it's his first time playing linebacker. And I mean, he's just running. He's he's running around out there making plays. Yep. But he he has like no experience doing it, and right. he's still making an impact. No, that's a great point. So uh, imagine, you know, game by game, you should see an improvement, and then you know the off season and the next season, you're going to see a dramatic improvement, and yeah. then the next one. And like you said, probably only be here three years, and chances are he's going to be a first round pick. You know, maybe even a top ten, top five pick when it's all said and done. What do you think is going to happen at the middle linebacker position? Yeah. Is it Jesse Lucada eventually, or is it Jan Johnson for the balance of the year? Uh, does it get to a point where it's even snap counts? And the guy you didn't mention is Ellis Brooks. Yeah, that's true. Um, I do like Brooks. Yeah, he's, he's solid. It's, so I'm not sure, really, to be completely honest with you. I think that I think Jesse Lucada is probably the long-term plan at middle linebacker. Um, I think he, he is very similar – um, to Parsons in the sense of his athletic ability at the mm-hmm. position. Oh yeah, um, I, he's not a freak like Parsons. Not many people are in college football. Um, but I think that he is probably the long term answer. It's just a matter of you know when when do you start to put in the long term? I mean, you don't want to put a long term guy in a position because you're six six and four towards the end of the year and you're starting to build for next year. Um, you want it to be because. He's just that good, and he's giving you the best chance to win, and you're still winning games. Yep. That that is, and it's just a matter of, and I see that being the reason over the six and four towards the end of the year. But um, I don't know. I mean, if Jan Johnson, I don't know how much he's really hurting them right now. Um, you know, he's not a star. Everybody knows that. He's just kind of 
Um, you know, think of, you know, uh, Brandon Smith, number 47. Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, just sound, fundamental, tough guy. From Hard. an athleticism pe- people standpoint, people to even talk about Cabenda in terms right. of positionally speaking. Yeah. I think Cabenda had a little bit of athleticism over Jan Johnson, clearly, but the same idea, right? He, yeah, it, I he's mean, more... He's more Dan Connor and Jason Cabenda than he is LeVar Arrington. Yeah, clearly. And I mean, Parsons is more LeVar Arrington. Right, absolutely. And, uh, right. and I mean, but here's the thing with your middle linebacker. It's very much like your quarterback of the defense. I mean, he's calling, you know, he's saying what's going on. And, and that's where the mental part of it comes in is he's, he's a redshirt junior, and the guys behind him are freshmen. Mm-hmm. Ellis Brooks, redshirt freshman. Yep. Jesse Lucetta, true freshman. True freshman, yeah. So I think that's a whole other part of, you know, when do we expect to see – do we expect to see um, one of those guys overtake Johnson, or do we keep seeing the the reps split up a little bit? Yeah, and then on the Cam Brown side, you know, any any thoughts there? I think he, I think Cam Brown. I mean, he's interesting because he's built like a wide receiver. I mean, he's six five. Um, I think he's like two twenty five, two thirty, something like that. I mean, he's a lanky guy, and um, he's another guy that I think's getting better by the week. Um, He's somebody that would have benefited from a, a redshirt freshman season. Was unable to do it because because of depth at the linebacker position. Um, I think he was like a D end in high school, and he's just he's still raw to the position. But he's an he's an athletic guy. Sure. He makes plays. Um, and and behind him, I, I like his backup Jarvis Miller too. When he gets a chance to play, he makes plays. Um, so I mean. I think that they're they're both serviceable out there. I think the the interesting one to me is Koa Farmer. Actually, um, I think that he's probably still listed as a starter. But like we said, Parsons is going to continue and continue to play more. Yeah, I'll, I'll take the start on the cornerback position because I find it very interesting. Amani Oberarie and Tariq Castro Fields are stars. I think they got a chance to really be stars. Uh, on the John Reed side, you know, other than Micah Parsons, that might be the interesting, most interesting personnel uh, phenomena going on this year in that he really struggled against App State, and then they they yanked him um, for, for an injury, an injury right. that we or, didn't hear much about. Or maybe about. not necessarily an injury, but maybe it just didn't feel right to him out there coming yeah. off the torn ACL. And it also, it, it could very well be a mental thing, too. Yeah, and, that, I mean, and that's kind of where... that happens. And that's, that's something I'm going to be going. watching with Carson Wentz when he comes back this week and throughout the season is, is mentally. So was it... Me- and, and that's really the question, right? Because that can happen. Mentally, you can struggle and not be yourself. The question is, it's only a 12-game regular season. So how long can the coaches wait? And really, who dictated that decision and why is a real question right. that I have is James Franklin saying to John Reed, yo man, you got to go figure it out. I mean, maybe a little nicer than that, but you got to figure it out and let's work with it, but we're going to sit you down until it's ready to go. Or is it John saying, you know, Hey coach, I'm, I'm trying to get out there and play You know, I don't know what the situation right. was there and the time frame. more importantly, the time frame because we're sitting here, they have the benefit of a, a Friday night game against Illinois and then a long week heading into Ohio State. When's John Reed going to be a every down corner again? Exactly, because you don't want him not playing this week and then that's our, that's three weeks he's, he hasn't played and then coming back for Ohio State. You know right. what I mean? I think it's important that, that guys like John Reed and Tommy Stevens play this week because – you shouldn't throw impact players um, that you make game plans. You know they're in yep. your game plan. Don't throw them into a, a big game like Ohio State. Sure. You know get them get them in there. Get some confidence back. You know get the get the blood flowing a little bit. But you know I I totally agree with you in terms of Oruwariye and Casher Fields on the outside. I mean, this is a thing that Reed might only be really the nickel. Yeah. For now I mean, Which granted, granted a lot of a lot of. Um, Teams are going to play are going three wide receivers like yep. the whole game. Sure, and then you'll see two linebackers instead of three. Yeah. Um. So, and and that's actually. But you also have some very athletic linebackers yes. that can play some hybrid as right. well. That's true. But um, I mean, John Reed's already slated for the star position, which is the nickel yep. position, and uh, Casher Fields when he comes in, he'll go to the outside. So, I mean, it definitely is interesting. But I think that Casher Fields and Oruwari have played very well. It's uh, it's the quarterbacks, interesting. The quarterbacks have played well. It's really interesting though because last year before Reed got hurt, this is the clear cut number one cornerback NFL potential, and then he gets hurt last year, and that leads to the research or the really the breakout of Christian Campbell. 
I mean, what was he really going and, to be playing? At, and Oruwariye. Well, sure, you're right. Both of them, really. You're exactly right. Because it was it would be Haley, Brand Haley. and Reed. And you know, probably at that point, what uh, Christian Campbell as right. a, as an absolutely enormous <laughs> nickel corner at six foot one. Yeah, I and mean, now I mean, <laughs> and that and that I think has made guys like Oruwariye better for this year. Um, the subtraction of Reed last year sure. because I mean he didn't start and he got second team Big Ten. He he was the, he was the highest graded Penn State cornerback on the um, on the. Uh, the all Big Ten selections, That's right, which was and, really interesting. Yeah, and he but. is he is he's climbing up mock drafts right now. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, he catches it's, the football. It's so man. early, it's so early, but I just saw a mock draft and he's in the first round. Yep, he goes he's in the first and round, gets and the he, football, and he is what a lot of teams are looking for now, specifically Penn State, the tall, athletic cornerbacks. Yep, Castro Fields is the same way. Absolutely, and John 100%. Reed's a smaller guy, but he's very good. But um, but these guys are six foot and above, and and that's. That's that's really impressive, especially when you're guarding these bigger receivers. Well, because you see these colleges go this way, all and it's very, very much a trend because of some of the athletic specimens that are coming out at wide receiver. Remember, Lamont Wade came in as a higher rated corner than Tariq Castro Fields. Think about that for a second. Yeah. And where they are now. Now Lamont Wade, clearly much more diminutive than Tariq Castro Fields, and just wasn't ready to take on that position the way Castro Fields was. And the way that's and you know Reed in a similar way has a different body build than Castro Fields and Oruwariye do, so the line or I should say the the cornerback here I think is interesting. I'm going to give it an A, uh, but I think John Reed is an interesting interesting. Plug it's something here. interesting to follow. Yeah, I mean you you never know they might just find out even though he's healthy. Look, we like you better on the inside. Yeah, you know. Yep. So the last one on the defensive side of the ball is safety. Yeah, so so safety, I think that the first game, I, I think that they were a little weak, and I think they've improved mm-hmm. a little bit. I think that they got beat um, over the top a little bit in the yep. first game. And they, they've they been rotating. Uh, really, it's it's Scott and Garrett Taylor at the safety positions, and they've been throwing Lamont Wade in there. And I think yep. he's uh, he had a rough first game, um, but I think he had a good game against Pittsburgh. And um, I think it's a, it's a good group. Um, I don't think that they um, – they're not as good as they were last year. Um, you know, a lot of people always bash Troy Apke, um, but he's he's actually a really solid player. Um, so um, I don't think that they are that group, and I don't think they're going to ever be that group this year. But I, there's a lot of talent at the position, um, and, and they're going to be serviceable for Penn State. Some, I think the big thing is not to make the mistakes. Right. So Sometimes when you're watching a defensive um, formation and they have two safeties out there, it's not always easy to find with in a, in every single case. It's not always easy to find who's the strong safety and who's the free safety. In Penn State's case, it's extremely easy to find out who's the strong safety and who's the free safety because Garrett Taylor has such a nose for being kind of in and around that linebacking core right. that he's out there stuffing runs like and Marcus Allen last yeah. year. Sure, absolutely. Right. And then clearly on the other side, Nick Scott plays more of that free safety, but he's also aggressive as yeah, well. I mean, they're, you know? both, they're both hard hitters, which yeah, I love, clearly. I mean, especially at the safety position. So. Yeah, and so I think that it's it's one of those growth areas because the, neither of them got time. Nick Scott got beat out for the Apke job last year, and Garrett Taylor is now coming in really as a – He was a cornerback at yeah, first. So. Right, and so you know, there's a lot of chemistry that needs to be – Built there, uh, saw in the pick game. Aaron Monroe got some snaps as well. Yeah, you know, John that's... Sutherland. Yep. Yeah. Yep. The, new, the new number twenty six. Yes. He's got the dreads too. So. <laughs> so uh, I think that position is very much um, in flux to some extent. I mean, I think Taylor and Scott will be your guys, but they're willing to make some rotations and they, there. W- Wade will play. Yep. Monroe will play. Even Sutherland will play. Yeah. So I think that's an interest. I know we kind of got away from the actual letter grades, but I don't think anybody really cares as much about the letter grades. It's about the discussion and where things are going. And uh, I think the strength of the corners is going to help the safeties improve. Yeah, and and I think that the strength of the D, the D ends and the pass rush are going to help the safeties improve too. Yeah, because anytime you have have a pass rush, it makes you know life miserable for the quarterback, and and it makes your your defensive backfield look better. Sure. So yeah. Um, one last thing, I don't know if we were going to touch on it, but I wanted to talk about special teams a yeah, little bit. Yeah, of course. Bit. Um, because I I'm a little uh, 
I'm a little upset with the special teams so far this year. Now, the kicking game and the punting game, I think, has been good. Uh, Jake Pinniger comes in, true freshman, hasn't missed an extra point, missed one kick, a 45-yarder at Pitt in the rain. Um, but um, and, and the kick return game and the punt return game has been really good. good. However, the kick coverage game has been suspect at times. We saw that in App State. And also, two and on- Kent State. Did they have a big return? They took it back. Their first touchdown. Kent State, did Wasn't they? Wasn't it? I don't... Am I going nuts? Let me see here. <laughs> Anyway, anyway, point the, the two um, – they gave up those two onside kicks that the kicker, like, recovered. I mean – Yeah. And, and both of them you have to be ready for, and they're just – they weren't ready. Right. So, I don't know. That's that's kind of something that has to be cleaned up. It's like – You're right. One time's okay, but not two. I am thinking about the onside kick. Okay. That's what it was. Uh, that's what it was. That happened in both the App State game and the Kent State game. Kent State's touchdown, I believe we jumped off sides, and yeah. Oro Warrior went up to intercept it, yep. went through his hands, and he caught it for a touchdown yep, early on in the right. game. That's exactly right. So, um, yeah, I mean, that, I, I agree with everything kind of you're saying about the all the different positions especially. pinnaker has been solid. Really solid, and I don't even really hold that uh, field goal against him. Now he hasn't really had a ton of work yet, and that's he'll good. Have, he'll have that's some, good. It is good. He'll have some pressure yeah, kicks. Yeah, definitely. As they move on, but, definitely. Um, boy, we this is flown by, man. You, you want to pick a couple games before we get out of here? All right, let's take a look at the schedule for Week Four. All right, give me one second. As we he does that, uh, Friday Night Lights at Illinois is going to be a lot of fun going out there. The first time that uh, Penn State or you know really any anybody, I guess they've done a couple of these, but Friday Night Tilts for the Big Ten specifically is going to be a lot of fun. And Penn State is out and out said that it's not going to happen in Happy Valley. They can't get a hundred thousand people. Thank God. I know you're not going to get people up from work on a Friday night. And if you did, could you imagine that traffic at Harrisburg? Mm. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So it's not going to happen to Penn state, but it happening on the road where Penn state's playing. I got no problem with it. I think it'll be a lot of fun, yeah, especially in an environment like Illinois. I mean, it kind of, <laughs> what, it, what does it, that mean? Like, you know exactly <laughs> what it means, but uh, it, it gives it a little more, you know, meaning. I mean, they're gonna. Their fans will be jacked up for a game like this as opposed to a, a twelve o'clock Saturday start, which uh, out there is eleven. The, there it right. Is. So I think it's great that you know it's gonna have a jacked up crowd. And I think that's good for Penn State. Agreed. Um, you know, it's better than going out and watching a game at twelve noon. I mean, you know, you, it gives and it also gives you something to watch on Friday night in case you're not watching anything. Um, but this week's games actually are kind of a a rather boring slate. It looks like. Um, one of the ranked matchups we have is A and M at Alabama. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I I think we know where we're going with that pick. Yeah, I like Bama, although I was very impressed with Texas A and M and what they did against Clemson. That said, I'm not sold on Clemson either. I mean, Alabama just seems to be on a whole another level. Um, but let's see other I games. I mean, I would go. I'm obviously going with Alabama there too. Um, other interesting games. Let me see. here. Florida at Tennessee. Gosh. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um, you never know what you're getting. I, I think I like Florida. I still like Dan Mullen and, and what he's doing, and I think they rebound after uh, what was a real kick to the you-know-what against Kentucky. I, I agree. I, find a I, way. I, I am actually going Florida as well. Um, Tennessee just – Florida's got better talent right now. Not that it's great, but it's better than what Tennessee – they they're both uh, first year head coaches, right? Um, but that being said, I, I'm still going Florida, even though it's in in Knoxville. Uh, another game that we uh, the big one, eight o'clock ABC, number seven Stanford at number twenty Oregon. Yeah, I like Stanford. Do you? Mm-hmm. I'm actually I'm gonna go Oregon on this. Yeah, I I just think the home crowd. Um, it's Hudson been a Stadium. it's been a long time coming for Oregon football to have another game on the stage like this. Yeah. And I think they're going to be ready for it. It's kind of one of those night game. It's one of those games that I'm just kind of favoring the home team right now. I think Stanford is a better team, but I just think that Justin Herbert, the quarterback at Oregon, finds a way. Heisman candidate finds a way to put his name on the map um, and put Oregon really back on the map. Yeah, and that is a tough place to play at night. One of the loudest stadiums. They only have about fifty-five, sixty thousand to get in there, but it is consistently one of the loudest it decibel is. stadiums. And um, and the last game that we will pick um, before doing an upset, uh, let's go Wisconsin after a tough loss at home against BYU. They travel 
to play Iowa, a night game, Kinnick Stadium. Iowa City, always a tough place to play for the road team, especially wow. at night. What's the line there, if you don't mind Let me, me see if I, I can get go, the line. I might go Iowa outright. Um, well, Iowa, according to ESPN <laughs> Football Power Index, 51% wow. chance to win North, or Wisconsin, excuse me, 49 in the spread. It's looking like Wisconsin is minus three right now. Yeah, give me give me the points. I like the Hawkeyes there. I Out, really do. Do you like them outright? Outright. Okay. I mean, it's going to be interesting to me to see how Wisconsin, um, you know, rebounds after that that loss that they yeah. looked horrible against BYU. Yeah. And 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 if Wisconsin does lose this game, not only is like the playoff, they they have to win out to make the playoff. At Absolutely, this point. But, but the fortunate thing for them is that their schedule is much more difficult than last year. It is difficult, but if they lose this game, I mean, their season could really take a spiral. I agree. I mean, they have a lot of tough games games left, including totally the trip agree. to Penn State. Um, I'm going. I'm going Wisconsin. I think they're going to bounce back. I think it's going to be incredibly close. I kind of see like a tw- like a kind of like last week a 24-21 type of game. Yeah, it's at night. I was going to be fired up. I mean, hell. Excuse me. Heck, they think that okay. this could be their year. Um, yeah, they, they, I mean, they have Nate Stanley at quarterback. Mm-hmm. This is kind of I kind of get the feel of Penn State going in there last year, early in the season, Big Ten opener. So um, we, we'll see. But I'm I'm gonna go I'm gonna go Badgers in this, and then um, upset. Let's see here. Do you have your upset pick yet? Uh, I'll have some fun with it. Yeah, give me uh, give me the Hoosiers oh, over no. Michigan State. Wow. Who's the home team for that one? That is Indiana. They are five point dogs. Unbelievable. Dog. That's not that big of a spread. Yeah. Um would it be Fine. an would it be an upset if I picked uh, Rutgers to upset Buffalo? Is that uh, <laughs> <laughs> especially after the Kansas game last what week? What is that uh, line? Well, uh, that line By is, the way, oh that was my we that, picked that game you, we too. We did pick that game. Yeah. Um that line is oh my god. It looks like it's even right now. Really? I, That's awful. Right? Even? That is awful. <laughs> I, I, there's nothing. I. That's ridiculous. That's all, that's all time low for Rutgers, that, I think. That is embarrassing. <laughs> oh, well, my goodness. Um, and I think I like, by the way, if I had to just uh, give me a lock. You I, know, I like Arkansas to cover at plus 30 against Auburn. Plus How about 30, that? huh? I don't know. That's Arkansas ridiculous. is pretty bad, though. Did you see that fake they punt that bad. North Texas pulled off, the punt return? He didn't, he didn't fair catch it, <laughs> and they all stood around. He just took off. Anyway, uh, um, my upset, I will go with – let me see here. You know what? Whatever. <laughs> we're going Wake Forest. We're doing it live. <laughs> Wake Forest over Notre Dame. Okay, wow. It's uh, Notre Dame's first away game of the year. Um, they haven't looked great since their initial win. They haven't looked great since win. Michigan. I mean, they struggle with Ball State. LaSalle's finest, Kyle Shermer. Yeah. Leading them down at the end. Wide receiver doesn't hold on to a tough catch. Mm. I mean, Vanderbilt could have won that game. Yes. I mean, to no to a lot of surprise, but watching the game, to no surprise, Vanderbilt was very much capable of winning that game. So I'm going Wake Forest. Um, yeah. I mean, they just had a they just lost to Boston College. Uh, you know, they the Hurricane. I'm not sure how Winston Salem has been impacted, but you never know. Maybe they play with an extra chip on their shoulder for their home state with the Hurricane Florence. Right. Um, you know, players, you know, hopefully that they didn't really lose, you know, any loved ones or, or stuff like that. But mm-hmm. sometimes teams like that, they get up for a game like that. It's 12 o'clock at Wake Forest. That's that's my upset pick. I don't like – I mean, listen, it's your pick, not mine. I don't like that pick, but if they do beat Notre Dame, watch out for the Irish falling because then they play Stanford and then Virginia Tech in the following two Is that weeks. who they have coming up? Wow. So I think they win this one, and then it's a dogfight against Stanford. Two teams that are just going to line up, offensive line, try to run it down your throat. Is it safe to say that Notre Dame is your second favorite team due to your uh, uh, fiancé and soon-to-be wife? Would I get in trouble if I said no? It depends if she's listening yeah, or not. That's <laughs> point. Uh, listen, I, I have no – I mean, I – do I uh, appreciate Notre Dame and the team? Sure. Um, I don't know. I, I, I suppose. There's I guess. no second team. Yeah, there is no. That's kind of what I'm yeah, getting right. at. Um, but I do watch more of their games now than I used to. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, looking at their schedule, that is their their toughest games are those two games: um, home against Stanford and then at Virginia Tech back to back weeks. 
Florida State is nowhere where anybody thought they would be this yeah. year. Yes. Um, that that is a joke of a program right now as it stands. Yeah. Um, embarrassed at Syracuse, and then they end the season at at USC. So I mean, not the toughest schedule, but definitely watch out the next Meet in three, the middle. three games. Right. Meet in the middle. Correct That's for sure. Well, good stuff here, Tyler. I uh, appreciate you coming on, and I I think this was a great way to kind of parlay uh, Penn State going from non-league play into Big Ten play at Illinois, and you know kind of keep those grades in mind as they continue to move forward and see where this team goes. Definitely, and I think that Penn State is like a heavy favorite. I don't know the exact number, maybe like twenty high twenties, it might be. Yeah. Um, but you know, I think that. Um, they're definitely going to win. Um, twenty eight ho- points. Twenty eight points. Hopefully, Woo. hopefully it's around there. I mean, that's a large, it's a large number. But I think the main thing is to s- continue to see improvement, stay injury free, um, you know, turnover free, continue to get Sanders going. I think this is another week. I've been saying it for the third week in a row now. Get Johnson going. I mean, he's going to be. You're going to need him. Yep. Um, you know, he's he's got to get over the drops. You're going to need him. He's a big time weapon. So. Um, and, and to shore up the tackling, I think they have shored up the tackling, but just to continue to do it, it's a Big Ten game on the road at night. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's go time, really. It all, it, the season started, but the new season starts now. Yeah, good stuff, Tyler. Appreciate you coming on. Appreciate everybody watching here tonight. We'll take a break, and, uh, well, until next week, Bob Long, Tyler Galehouse. See you soon.